My name is Jason Schuster and I'm a doctor of physical therapy. All right, you guys, epithalon. This is one that a lot of my medical doctor friends really, really like a lot because of its effect on the telomeres, right? So we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. So epithalon is AEDG is another word for it, right? So that's just the amino acid sequence, alanine, glutamine, aspartic acid, and glycine. Another way that people write is, is without the H, so epitalon, same thing as epithalon. So epithalon is a derivative of epithalamin. It's a polypeptide released from the pineal gland, right? So as far as I understand you guys, the pineal gland in the, in the base center of our brain is the only part of the brain that is unilateral, right? So everything else, and this as far as I understand, everything else in the brain has is split. There's, there's double, right? There's one in, one in the right hemisphere and one in the left hemisphere. So it's a telomerase activating enzyme that upregulate that upregulates the synthesis of telomerase, right? So the upregulation of telomerase, so the way this is happening is this peptide is leading to the expression of the genes that produce telomerase, which helps lengthen telomeres, right? And it helps improve telomere health. Telomeres, this is spoken about really, really heavily, you guys, in the epigenetics and epigenome class. The telomeres, just real briefly, are the little caps on the ends of the chromosomes. And basically, the longer your telomeres are, the more health and regeneration abilities that your cells have and the longer your cell lifespan is and the longer, theoretically, your lifespan will be, right? So things that improve telomerase typically improve overall health of the cell because they're working on one of the base structures and that includes improving mitochondrial health as well right so having longer telomeres improves the hay flick limit of the cells it improves their ability to replicate all that stuff is spoken about in depth in the epigenome and epigenetics class but that's one of the primary ways that epithalon is working is through lengthening the telomeres or it seems so at least right so one of the things that neurodegeneration has in common or neurodegenerative diseases is almost all of them that I know of seem to cause abnormal shortening of the telomeres and decrease of telomerase function, right? And then other things like NMN, NAD+, that stuff, those help increase tel telomere length. So epithalon helps increase telomere length. A lot of these other peptides and supplements and vitamins help increase telomere length. Almost all diseases that I know of decrease telomere length, right? So, so that should that should show you something right there. And epithalon is in a, a whole bunch of different cells, right? So it helps with the generation of new mesenchymal cells. It helps differentiate stem cells, right? So we know that adults have active stem cells in our long bones and in the suture lines of our skull, you guys. This was discovered relatively recently, like within the last year, I think. Um, there's some papers definitively showing that we have active stem cells in the suture lines of our skull, which may be one reason that needling the suture lines in the in the skull seem to have seems to have such a good effect on autonomic nervous system homeostasis. So short peptides, di, tri, or tetrapeptides, so that would be with two, three, or four amino acids, right? They help regulate and modulate the way that the DNA and the histones and the nucleosomes are expressed inside the cell itself, right? So none of this stuff is changing the DNA at all. It's just changing the way that our DNA is expressed, which is exactly how eating good food helps us be healthier, right? So some proteins interact directly with the DNA, like methylation process, where, where methyl groups attach onto the outside of the DNA itself, and transcription factors, different proteins and stuff do that. Not all of them interact directly with the DNA, right? So we, we still really are just scratching the surface as far as what the DNA actually is, right? It's, it's a code for proteins, it seems like, but the DNA itself doesn't actually tell the proteins what to do. It just makes the proteins and then the proteins do stuff. So that's like a big mystery in genetics right now, you guys. It, and this is still being taught completely incorrectly in medical school, where most medical students come out of school assuming that more or less whatever your genes are is how you're gonna be, and that's blatantly wrong, right? Almost all humans have the same sweet of genes it's just how those genes are expressed which makes us different there's only some rare diseases like tay sachs and trisomy 21 where if you have a genetic anomaly where you like have a triplication of a gene that causes big problems that's super duper rare it's mostly the people all people have the same genes genes they're just bringing being expressed slightly differently 
So ADG increases grow associated protein 43 or GAP 43 and a protein called nestin, neurofilament protein, right? Synthesis in human, uh, in, our, in our gum cells, we see nestin a lot. And it helps to upregulate differentiation of different cells that have shown to have anti-aging effects in mice models. Right? The GAP43 protein encoded by the GAP43 gene, it's been termed a growth or plasticity protein because it, it's expressed at high levels during neuronal growth, right? And development and regeneration. So if you have too few of these proteins, you can't regenerate nerve cells, regular tissue cells, other soft tissue cells, it becomes a big problem, right? So GAP43 is considered a crucial component of effective regeneration responses in nervous tissue. And nestin is a neural epithelial stem cell protein and it's present in a variety of cells and stem cells, including pancreatic islet cells, skeletal muscle satellite cells, developing myotomes, testes, hair follicle, heart tissue, and bone marrow. So just like with GHK, and just like with thymus and beta-4 and thymus and alpha-1 and BPC-157, they're all more highly concentrated when we're younger and growing. And that's one of the reasons that we heal so much faster when we're younger is because we have higher concentrations of these proteins, you guys. So exogenously or externally, putting proteins into the body that the body needs to make to be helpful you're kind of bypassing the step of make of forcing your body to make the proteins you're bypassing some energy requirement and by putting those peptides directly into the body you are then also regulating the expression of the genes themselves so they, they're working on numerous factors you guys you're putting in the building materials themselves in the form of these peptides that the body needs to use and the peptides have a reverse action on the DNA itself so if you have more healthy peptides in your body they help give your DNA a a more healthy expression which helps you be more healthier right or healthier so dosing for epithalon right so again like a lot of these you guys there's a bunch of different ways you can dose very very safe right so this is one that you take less frequently than BPC-157 and the other ones that we've talked about so far, right? So the other ones we've talked about so far typically talk about doing it like an eight week on cycle, eight week off cycle, a couple of times a week. Epithalon is different, right? So six courses over three years is one way that people do it, right? So 10 milligrams, in two milliliters of saline, one molar every three day, right? So it'd be five shots per course, a dose of 50 milligrams. So six courses over three years. So that would be, you could do it at six month intervals, right? With a total dose of 300 milligrams and you can repeat it every six months to a year. So the Dr. Edwin Lee, does this twice a year for himself and his patients. So that's that's something to think about. He really knows what he's doing with this stuff. He's using it every day in practice. I really trust what he says on this stuff. So this is his dosing schedule. Again, his website is clinicalpeptidesociety.com. Really, really good website. So that's some dosing options. Epithalamin, epithalamin or epithalamin or epithalamin, it's really, really amplifying the internal energy production ability of our cells. Epithalamin, stimulates telomerase, which in turn increases telomeres of our DNA, right? So here's a picture of the little telomeres, the little caps at the end of the chromosomes. The longer our telomeres, the more protection our chromosomes have from damage and the more replicability our cells have. So it really, really helps improve length of telomeres by up to 33%, you guys. So theoretically, that improves the health span and lifespan of your cells by 33%, which is going to improve your health span and lifespan by a significant amount as well, right? So very, very helpful. Helpful. Remember, you guys, people that exercise, the most, the, the most significant indicator of lifespan and health span is just exercise. So people that exercise, especially if you eat well, on average, live about a decade and a half longer than people that don't exercise and don't eat well. And one of the reasons that that exercising and eating well helps people live longer is because it helps amplify the amount of these peptides that are in our body. And we can prove that without question just by looking at the differences in these peptide concentrations between healthy and unhealthy people. So the differentiation capacity of epithalamin, it, it, some of the studies talk about it upregulating up intracellular lipid chaperones, which regulate lipid trafficking in, inside the cells, right? So. People with high lipid concentrations inside their cells tend to be really unhealthy or tend to be in really good shape. So this is one of like the counterintuitive things about the human body. It's just the way that the body is using said material. So 
people that are in very, very good shape, like high level cyclists and stuff, they need that fat in their cells because it's a good form of energy. People that aren't in really good shape with all that fat in their cells, the fat is in there for a different reason and it's causing problems. Just like with a lot of the other stuff we've talked about, epithalon helps with uh, insulin resistance, energy homeostasis, triglyceride metabolism, lipoprotein metabolism, lipogenesis, fatty acid up uptake, oxidation, storage and export of garbage in the cells, cell proliferation, helps improve inflammation, and vascular tissue function. So all that stuff is good. One our article was specifically looking at how epithalon helps improve the interaction of histones in DNA. So remember, histones are proteins that make up nucleosomes, and then the, the DNA wraps around the nucleosomes. So the histones and the nucleosomes in the DNA can be thought about kind of as like one one big complex and they're all working on each other so epithalon has some effects on that and again it's been shown to improve cellular lifespan telomere length it improves melatonin synthesis which is going to help with your sleeping right and it helps improve pineal gland function so the pineal gland is not very well understood at all but it's very very important for a whole bunch of stuff that we know of and helping that gland improve its function is going to help improve the function of the rest of the body or at least that's what we've seen in these studies so far right so overall epithalon regulates pineal gland function melatonin synthesis reduces oxidative stress stimulates neuronal differentiation optimizes immune function reduces the risk of tumor development so this is another anti-cancer one you guys improves endocrine function decreases chronic inflammation which leads to cancer so chronic inflammation is one of the things that causes the body to, to start overproducing cancer cells it's also one of the hall hallmarks of aging along with loss of telomere length so these peptides are acting on the hallmarks of aging which should be helping us improve our mental and physical health which it appears to do and again i can just tell you from personal experience this stuff really does help me feel better um, i take all these peptides and the supplements that i talk about i've never had any of my friends that take this stuff mention anything negative about them um, so they just seem to be overall very very healthy and healing and extremely safe with basically zero serious negative adverse side effects so there's no reason that this stuff shouldn't be used in mainstream medicine across the country you guys it's really really frustrating but also really exciting at the same time because there's so much potential to really improve people's health and well-being.